kind of a blessing of the seven spirits of God. Then I asked the Lord, but I don't know anything about this seven spirits of God. Please teach me. And for the next one and a half hours, the Lord sat and taught me what the seven spirits of God are all about. So I ended up writing a book called On Eagle's Wings, which details about the seven spirits of God, what they are, how you can receive them, what you should do to receive them, and how each of the seven spirits works. They manifests from many, many biblical illustrations and examples, and how we can identify the manifestation, manifestation of this gift in our life, and also to enhance the anointing and to increase the power and the intensity of the workings of this gift. So, I originally preached this message at our brother Neville's church in the year 1995, I think. And uh, that was the first time that I ever taught this publicly. And then subsequently, I taught this at this church in uh, some years ago. And later on, when I sat down to write this book, the Lord had given me many, many more understanding from 1994 till now. So this is one book you want to get so that you can understand about the workings of these gifts. I saw once, early this year, the Lord Jesus Christ dressed in a seven-colored robe. And when I looked at him, I understood the seven-colored robe represented the seven spirits of God. And he spoke to me and he said, what you know about the seven spirits of God, which he was referring to the things that were shown to me in 1994, is a little of the larger anointings of the seven spirits. What you have so far received is one portion, but there are several other aspects of the anointings of the seven spirits of God, which God will make manifest to known to us in greater detail in these last days. If you read Zechariah chapter 4, there the prophet Zechariah sees the vision of two lampstands and two olive trees. And the lampstands were pouring out its oil. And from the seven bowls on the lampstand, oil was being poured out. The Lord told me, the pouring out of the oil from the seven bowls of the lampstand represents one aspect of the anointing of the Holy Spirit or manifestation of the seven spirits of God where it is the, called the oiled anointing. Then if you read Revelation chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, the apostle John saw before the throne of God seven lamps burning and the seven lamps were in seven different colors. And that seven lamps represents the seven spirits of God. And that is another anointing, the fire, anointing of fire from the seven spirits. Then in Revelation chapter 5, verse 6, John saw the Lamb of God with seven horns and seven eyes. And the scripture says, the seven eyes and the seven horns represents the seven spirits of God that are sent out to all the world. Now the seven eyes is of another anointing, the anointing of the eyes. And the seven horns represents another anointing, the seven horns anointing. Now all these are different manifestations of the seven spirits of God and there are seven of them, seven manifestations of the seven spirits of God which God will make known to us 
in the last days. So far, I have been graced by God to receive revelation and understanding about the seven horns. And a friend of mine, a prophet of God in India, received a revelation from God in the year 2010 about the seven eyes anointing. Now there are more, the seven lamps, then the seven oils. So when we begin to flow in it, God will begin to pour out these seven spirits of God upon the church. The bride is going to be caught away in rapture. We talked about that earlier. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17, talks about that. So because the bride is going to be caught away, we must get ready. Purify ourselves. See, the bride who has made herself ready, the Bible tells us in Revelation chapter 19, verses 7, 8, and 9, that she was given a rope which was clean and white. Cleanliness, outward cleanliness of the body, where all the works of the flesh are crucified. And white signifies of the holiness of the heart. Yesterday you heard Brother Neville share that without holiness, Without purity of heart, no one can see God. And how he shared very candidly that there are many people in heaven who have never even seen God because there's no purity of heart. For the bride to walk hand in hand with the bridegroom, she must be clean on the outside and pure in the inside. Only then you can qualify to be the bright. So we want to make ourselves ready to be the bright. Secondly, God is going to ask for an account to reckon from us for all the giftings that he has given us thus far. If you read the parable that the Lord Jesus spoke in Luke chapter 16, verses 1 to 2. A parable about the dishonest manager. The Lord put him in charge, or the, the, his boss put him in charge of a company, but he was very dishonest. But the day came when the manager, the owner came back and asked him to account for himself what he has done. So, before the glory can be poured out upon us, we must give an account to God. What have we done so far with the little that has been given unto us? Or the little that we know? What have we done so far? Have you lived such a life for the Lord that will warrant Him to count you worthy to receive this. Let me give you one example. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, one of my staff's mother was dying. And that lady is about 73, 75 years old. And she was very sickly. All her life, she's a very sickly woman. Whenever she gets very close to death, this staff of mine will ask me to pray for her and miraculously the woman will be healed and come to life. And uh, this time, again she came very close to death and uh, my staff called me and she cried on the phone, said, please pray for my mother, she's dying. So I said, alright, let me pray. As I was praying, I could never pray a prayer of healing for that woman. Instead, I found myself saying, Lord, prepare her to meet you. And that sentence came out continuously out of my mouth. You know, even though if I tried to say, Lord, heal her, the words kept on coming, Lord, prepare her to meet you. Prepare her spirit, prepare her body, prepare her understanding so that she can meet you. And, uh, and then when finally I said, Amen, 
and this uh, staff asked me, will my mother be healed? So I said, don't worry, my daughter. Everything will be all right. Again, she asked me, will my mother be healed? I said, don't worry, my daughter. Everything will be all right. And the third time she asked me this question, and the third time I repeated the same thing. You know, I could not bring myself to say, no, your mother is going to die. No, I just prayed a prayer that your mother, when she closes her eyes, her soul will be ready to meet the Lord. And, uh, and though I was camouflaging my answer, she understood me because she has been working for me for 20 years. She knows my lingo, you know? <laughs> you know, when I, when I answer other people's questions, she's been standing there watching the language that I use, the words that I use, and she knows this sentence means that. So she cried and she said, please tell me the truth. Will my mother be healed? So I told her, my dear daughter, your mother is already very old. Why let her live again and go through all the pain? Just let your mother go. She said, she said no. I cannot let my mother go. You must pray a prayer and heal my mother. <laughs> so I assured her, okay, don't worry. Before I go to bed tonight, because she called me at about 10 in the night, you know. Before I go to bed, I promise you, I will pray for your mother. So that settled it. And before, I remember the, pray, the promise I made. So I knelt down to pray. I said, Lord, you know this. I told the whole situation to the Lord. And the Lord asked me a question. See, I stood before the Lord's presence in heaven. And he asked me, what profit is she to my kingdom for me to extend her life? I had no answer because I know this old woman all her life she's just been a good mother a good wife and a very nominal believer period she has not done anything worthy for the Lord all her life she's been taking care of her family a large family and then the many grandchildren all her life was limited to her family. Nothing worthwhile for the kingdom of God. So the Lord asked me, why should I extend her life? For what worth is she to my kingdom? See, and he said, furthermore, she has lived her life. See, the scripture says, you shall live for 70 or at the most 80. So she qualified. <laughs> you know, how to argue now against all that? So I pleaded with the Lord. I said, Lord, you promised 70 and 80, right? So this woman has another seven more years. So I pleaded with the Lord. I said, this one time, Lord, Extend her life. This one time. I will never ask you again. So he looked at me and he asked me, how many more years do you want me to extend her? I remembered Hezekiah. And I wanted to say, you see the thought came to my mind, 15. But out of my mouth came the word 3. <laughs> Look, don't stone me. So I told the Lord, Lord, extend her life for three more years. And the Lord looked at me and said, because you ask, I will do it for you. He said, go, she'll be healed. And the next day, or a few days later, I heard from my staff, her mother is so well and good and healed. You see, we need to give an account of our life. What is the life you are living? Do you think you are born in this world just to grow, have a college education, have a family, and then be a housewife, look after your kids, look after your grandchildren, period? 
Is that why God made you? No. You have been made, like what Neville said last night, to demonstrate the glory of the kingdom of God. So your life must count. Either, if not in big way, at least in small way. You know, early this year, my mother crossed 75 and she was showing signs of uh, some deterioration in her health. And I, I wasn't praying for her health. Ever since my father died three years ago, I could see some withdrawal symptoms in her. You now she became very quiet. She became a little withdrawn. She was never like that. I noticed all that ever since my father died. Then this year, on January the 1st, when I was praying, the Lord told me, tell your mother to get ready to meet me. So tell her how she should prepare herself to prepare her soul, to prepare herself to meet me, which means her time will come to die. So I called my mother. Of course, I didn't say she's going to die, you know. So I just said, you know, the Lord Jesus is coming very soon. You, we all don't know how long we will all live. So now you are also advancing in age. So why don't you now put your life right and put away all other things. Forget about caring for your grandchildren. Forget about caring for all your children. Just now focus on preparing your soul purifying it, preparing it to meet the Lord. And ever since in the last uh, eight months now, she has done that. She's put away everything else. She stopped visiting the children, she stopped visiting the grandchildren. She just watches our television network day and night. She prays every day. I mean, not that she wasn't praying before. She has doubled it up. And then she does ministry. She goes with our women's group to visit old folks' home and bring words of encouragement, words of healing, and she joins a prayer network to intercede and to pray for the people. See, making yourselves worthwhile for the kingdom of God, even in your grey age. No one is useless in the kingdom of God. So prepare yourselves to give an account. Next, God's army is going to rise up mightily. So therefore, prepare them. Joel chapter 2, verse 11. We'll talk more about this tomorrow and in the next session that I will have. The seven spirits are seven anointings that are going to be poured out upon this world. When these seven anointings are poured out, it will raise up seven groups of people among whom are children, youths, senior citizens, and ministers. Seven groups of angels have been appointed to oversee this outpouring. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 15, verses 5 to 8, you'll read about seven angels bearing seven bowls of the wrath of God to be poured out upon this world. So when God does something important, He appoints seven angels to do those works. You read about seven angels who blow the seven trumpets. You read about seven angels who pour the vials of God. And then seven angels who pour the wrath of God. So they are always in multiples of sevens. Now, these seven groups of angels will go into the churches and prepare them to receive the seven spirits of God. The churches need to be prepared to receive. They will point out how will these angels prepare the churches. They will point out shortcomings in the churches and prepare the believers to receive the anointing. Now let me give you two examples about angelic work in this area 
of pointing out shortcomings and preparing the people for receiving the glory. First example is found in Luke chapter 1 verses 18 to 20. You'll read about the angel Gabriel come and talk to Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist, about a son that is going to be born. And then Zechariah opens his mouth and speaks out a word of unbelief. As soon as he said that, Gabriel will point out his shortcoming and rebuke him for his unbelief. Secondly, the same angel Gabriel appeared to Mary in Luke chapter 1 verses 26 to 38 and he speaks to her about the coming Messiah who is going to be born in her. Now what he spoke prepared her to receive the Son of God in her womb. So you have two examples now. The work of the angel to point out shortcomings and the work of angels to prepare us to receive the glory. Now just as the Lord Jesus went to prepare a place for his people to stay with him, likewise we should prepare a place in our church within us for the seven spirits to come and dwell in us. If you read Mark chapter 14, verses 12 to 16. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him. And wherever he enters, say, to the master of the house. Now please note the next sentence. The teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And verse 15 says, This man had prepared a large room. He had prepared and furnished a large room to receive the Lord Jesus and the disciples. Now the man did not know who was coming. But he prepared and furnished in the same way. You need to prepare yourselves. Furnish yourself with the word of God. Furnish yourself speaking in the spirit. That will make you very, very spirit conscious. You should spend at least one hour a day praying in unknown tongues. The more you pray in unknown tongues, the more spirit conscious you will become. Not only that, your spiritual eyes will be enlightened. It will become brighter and sharper to see things in the spirit. Once your eyes become sharper and brighter, you will no more say, you know, when I saw this vision, I do not know whether it's this or that. You don't have to say like that. Because your eyes will see them crystal clear in high definition. Don't you want that? Yes. The only way to sharpen your spiritual eyes and sharpen your spiritual ears and sharpen your spiritual sensitivity is by praying in unknown tongues more and more. Minimum one hour. The more, the better. You know, once I did a research. What will happen to me if I prayed continuously in unknown tongues for 8 hours a day, 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day, 24 hours a day? What will happen? So I journal. When I began to pray, I journal from hour to hour what was happening inside me. And I began to realize my eyes were getting sharper by the hour. And eventually, on the second day, I saw open visions all over the room. Anywhere I turned, in 360 degrees, it was like even before there was 
this technology of high definition. Now, this was in 1992. High definition only came out recently in 2009. But then I saw this huge vision, open vision, in whichever direction that I turn around, all over the room in 360 degrees. And that was just two days of praying continuously in unknown tongues. What if you do it all your life? Then forever you are living in an open vision atmosphere. Amen? Yeah. It is absolutely possible. And anyone, whether young or old, young or old, not only in physical age, but in spiritual age, when you do this, when you do this spiritual discipline, and this spiritual exercise, you will be more than a conqueror. You will transcend or transit from an ordinary believer to become a seer. Not only with your ears, your eyes, but also your ears. You can hear of what the enemy speaks miles away. Even across continents. That was the gift that was upon Elisha. You know, he was in Israel, but he could hear what the king of Syria was speaking in his bedroom. It beats any of CIA's eavesdropping equipment. <laughs> it will put all of their equipment to shame because you don't need any devices. All you need is years of the spirit. And any secrets, even the whisper of the heart, even the thoughts of the mind, they speak and you will hear them. Can you believe this? Yes. They all speak loud, you know. You know, before I came to this conference here, I was fasting and praying in Singapore. And one day, I had a visitation from this will that you read of in Ezekiel chapter 1. And it says there are eyes all over the wheels. And as I was looking at this wheel, one eye among all the eyes stood out and he just looked at me. And as I was looking at the eye, the eye spoke. I was wondering, how can an eye speak? But this eye spoke to me. You know, do you have a theology for that? No. Is this unbiblical? No, you all are so quiet. Is this unbiblical? No. But in Ezekiel chapter 1, you will read, the spirit of God is in the wheels. And if the Spirit is there, is the Holy Spirit, He can speak. Yes. Right? Yes. The seeing eye also speaks. Hey, if a donkey can speak, <laughs> how much more? A donkey is a creation on this earth. If the donkey can speak, how much more things in heaven? Everything has a voice. A trumpet speaks in heaven. A trumpet only makes sound. Right? You know, we have wonderful instruments here. Keyboard, a piano, a drum, and uh, oh, some of the instruments are missing. They were here last time. This, you know, when uh, our dear sister Jean and John plays the keyboard, you hear nice sounds of piano that comes out of the keyboard. Have you ever heard the piano opening small say, Then sings my soul. <laughs> The piano doesn't speak like that. But in Revelation chapter 1, you read a trumpet spoke with John. A trumpet, instead of making a sound, it spoke with John. And then you read in Revelation chapter 15 that the four horns on the altar spoke a horn. How can a horn speak? But the horn spoke. And then in Revelation chapter 10, 
you read of thunders speaking you on this earth you only hear the sound of a thunder the pealing thunder sound but in heaven the thunder speaks everything that has the breath of god has a voice amen it has a voice when your ears are circumcised when they become very highly spiritually sensitized you can hear and speaking in tongues will enhance that ability of yours to hear and thirdly speaking in tongues increases your spiritual sensitivity before your eyes sees you will now perceive in your spirit okay someone is here and then you open your eyes to your right or to your left you see an angel of god standing or some heavenly beings first your spirit picks it up you know then your eyes sees then your ears hear so all this thing for your sp- spiritual sensitivity to increase for your spiritual eyes to be enlightened for your spiritual ears to increase in its audibility the shortcut or the foundation is speaking in unknown tongues it increases your spiritual sensitivity even it increases your faith that's what the bible says if you want to have more faith don't pray for it just pray in unknown tongues amen, amen. finally when the lord spoke prepare the people for glory he showed me a vision of what is happening in heaven and how heaven is preparing to pour out the glory and i saw a glorious place in heaven which was filled with glory and there were many angels coming forth with bowls in their hands all carrying that spirit seven spirits of god to pour out and i also saw eagles bright golden white eagles flying all over in heaven which are the prophet saints who take on the form of eagles they were flying forth from that place to come to visit us to prepare us and teach us for the journey that we need to walk you know nature tells us when a eagle goes through a molting process it is almost like in a dead position it cannot it's all bald it's all bleeding and it's big is broken its talons are all fallen over it's like almost in a dead position it cannot hunt for food during that period of time other eagles which have already gone to the molting process will bring food to feed these eagles in the molting season this was the picture the lord showed me concerning the arrival or the coming of the saints in glory to come and feed us and teach us when you are waiting on god when you are soaking in god but don't sleep you can soak but don't fall asleep that becomes sleeping in the lord <laughs> and this is the word of the holy spirit the bride is been prepared for the coming of the bridegroom the lord jesus is going to come and is coming for the bride if he is coming for the bride the bride must be made ready amen you cannot afford to take vacation any more there's no time you know every waking moment that we have is just one day closer to the coming of the lord jesus one day closer to the coming of the antichrist one day closer to the appearing 
or the proclamation of the false prophet. One day closer to the mark of the beast. One day closer for the end of everything. So if it is all one day closer to the end, every moment you live, you must make it tick for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. Let's stand up for a word of prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for making yourselves known to us. Thank you for teaching us your ways. Thank you for making yourselves known to us. And now I pray, Lord, all those who have heard this, prepare them to receive your glory. Even during these days at this During this conference, I pray that you will prepare my dear sisters and brothers and my dear children and my sons and daughters. Prepare them, Lord, to meet with you. Prepare them to receive all that you have reserved to be released during this conference. I thank you, Lord. Even as you have shown me in the past with regard to this church, Shekinah worship, Pastor Joseph Sweet, you may remember years ago when I mentioned seeing scrolls being put into the walls of this church. One more time I see, just like Joseph had prepared barns to store wheat for the times of tribulation. I saw the wall, I see the walls of this church filled with the scrolls of God. They, they appear not as walls but barns. Barns full of food, full of treasures for these last days. And you have been chosen, my dear brother, as a custodian, just like how Joseph was prepared in secret and in obscurity, down in a dungeon, forgotten, forsaken, but known unto the Lord. You have been prepared likewise for such a time as this. You will walk in the same anointing as Joseph walked. For you shall be lifted up as a prince to command the forces of God, even to channel and direct the armies of God, especially for this nation. So prepare yourselves, prepare your heart, keep it steadfast, locked on, 
looking straight ahead at your destiny and the purpose that God has determined for you. For I see you holding in your right hand the baton that was given to you years ago. And in the days to come, that baton will speak to you. It will open its mouth and speak to you concerning the oracles that are contained in it, the scrolls, the words of God that are contained in it, and the mysteries of God that are contained in it, and the destiny and the purpose. It will open its mouth and will speak to you. Not only it will speak to you, when it speaks to you, it will cause your eyes to be enlightened, to see, see the things that are spoken to you from the throne, I mean from the baton. Just like how, when the seals were broken one by one, the living creatures called out to John and said, Come and see. Instead of saying, Come and read, the creature said, Come and see. When John came and saw the scroll, it was not just letters, but it was moving pictures. In the same manner, Thank you, wonderful God. The baton is now hidden in your right hand, but it will come out of the, your right hand and then speak to you. Prepare your heart. And your dear wife also has a part in this. Prepare her, for together you are one. And both of you are one having this destiny. Thank you, wonderful Lord Jesus. Come on everybody, lift up your holy hands. And bless the name of the living God. Who is good. And his goodness is forever and ever. His mercies are from everlasting to everlasting. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new.